Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I'm going to be showing you how we can take this simple game object with a sprite renderer and an animator, basically a fireball, and turn it into an actual moving projectile that can collide with a player game object. So the first thing we're going to do is add component and we're going to create a new script. I'll just call this projectile script, keep it nice and generic for right now. And we will open this up in Visual Studio for editing. Okay, so inside of this projectile script, we're going to need to set up a few variables. Uh, one is going to be a move speed for the projectile because we want the projectile to move and we want to be able to set how fast it's going to move. So I'm going to call this public float move speed and we could default this to something arbitrary like 3f. We're also going to want a public int or you could technically make it a float uh, damage and I'm going to default that to five points of damage. This means that later on, when an object that can take damage collides with the projectile, that character or object is going to take five points of damage, which might mean health in your game. It usually means that. So now how we move the projectile is going to depend a little bit on whether or not you have a rigid body 2D. Uh, in this case, we're going to keep it simple and we're just going to update the transform of the projectiles game object. Um, that would be when you don't really need physics to interact in your game. Most really typical 2D games don't need that. Um, if you do need rigid body because you want physics to interact and to be able to apply forces to game objects and when like uh, a projectile bumps into something and actually moves that game object, then you want rigid body instead. But for simplicity's sake, if you want to update the transform here, we can take the move speed and apply it to the position of the transform. So in the update method, which is called once per frame, what I'm going to do is I'm going to update that transform position. So uh, because mono behavior has a direct reference to the transform, we can just reference that without uh, anything else. So transform dot position. And I'm going to set this equal to a new vector three. A vector three just means it has X, Y, and Z coordinates. So I'm going to break that into three parts here. So for transform X, I want that to be transform.position.x, the current position. And then I'm going to add in the move speed. Um, but we don't know exactly how many frames are running per second. So how we can work with that is to do times time dot delta time. And what delta time is, is the time since the last frame. That's usually going to be something like a 20th of a second represented by a float. So we take these values and we're going to add that to the position of X. So what this means is that the projectile would always be moving to the right because move speed is positive. Um, I guess if you actually made move speed negative, it would make it move to the left. Um, and we're just going to keep it that simple for right here. So everything else, the Y and the Z coordinates, uh, those are just going to be left as is. And the reason we need to create a new vector for this is that you can't directly uh, change the X, Y, Z values, as I recall. So we do need to do this. So uh, at transform X adds the move speed times, uh, times delta time. Uh, transform position Y is left alone, position Z is left alone, and now while this game object is active, it's going to start moving to the right, which is great. Um, now we can actually go ahead and test that in Unity real quick. So we have the projectile script attached. I'm going to hit play and see how this works. So you can see the projectile is moving to the right. Now it's not facing the right direction, which is an issue. But the important thing for right now is that it's moving in the right direction. So now what we need to do is actually set up collision because it needs to collide with the player object and it should do that as a trigger in this case. We don't want it to directly block the player. We want it to collide with the player, delete itself and deal damage to the player. Um, so we can do that with on trigger enter 2D. So in Visual Studio just start typing on trigger and it will be able to find that method for you which all mono behaviors are able to implement. So this method passes in a Collider 2D as a parameter, and the Collider 2D will be the thing that it collides with, the thing that this projectile is colliding with. So we can check to see if that Collider is of a certain type, which in this case we want to check a character type that we haven't created yet. 
So before we start writing this method, I'm going to want to create another script. And just to make things a little bit quicker, I'm going to duplicate this enemy game object. And we're going to turn that into a player. So I'm going to remove this spawner script. And I'm going to add a new character script that we're going to write right now. So you can see that the character has a box collider 2D and a rigid body 2D. So you can see that this uh, character has a box collider 2D already added to it. The rigid body 2D, we're going to remove that. Um, we don't need it for right now. And I'm going to rename this game object to, uh, let's make it player actually. And we can enable it if we want. Um, for the future, because we want the fireball to collide with it, I'll move it over to the right and that should make this fireball run into it in the future. Now we need to actually edit this character script. In this character script, I'm going to set a few variables. So I'll do public, um, let's call it an int health, and we'll default that to 50 points of health. And we'll create a uh, method called take damage. So void take damage is going to take an int of the damage taken. And we're going to update health to be minus equal to that damage. So basically we subtract the damage from the player's health. That's as simple as you could get. Um, and the reason we need this is uh, the projectile script, when it collides, it's going to need to make sure that the collider is something that can actually take damage before it runs the collider script. Now, uh, you could also make this an interface and then um, you could implement this interface in any model behavior class that you wanted to be able to take damage. You can also use this as a base class and then maybe make a parent class like player that extends character and then it already has the stuff included. Um, but we'll just keep it really simple for right now. So health and take damage. I think that's all it's going to need for right now. So now what we can do back on the projectile script for on trigger enter 2D is we can check if the collider 2D uh, contains a character script, basically if the game object has a character script attached to it. So I'm going to call this character character is equal to uh, collision um, game object dot get component. So we're checking to see if it has the character script attached to it. And if it finds one, it's going to set that to this character variable. And that will mean that the character variable is not null. So if character is not equal to null, then that character can take damage. Ah, I forgot to set it to be a public method. If you want it to be able to be called from other scripts, it should be set to public. So character dot take damage, and we're going to set the damage taken equal to the damage that the projectile does up here. And Oh, and the final thing we want to do is actually remove the projectile because it's not a every frame thing. It's a collide once and destroy the projectile thing. So let's do destroy game object here. And that's of course referring to the game object of whatever this script is attached to. So with that, uh, if I'm not wrong, okay, the fireball does need to have a box collider, but if I'm not wrong, that should be all the scripting we need here. Uh, so we do, of course, need to add a box collider 2D to the fireball. So I'm going to add a box collider. The, the, the collider shape is just to determine where the bounds of where it can collide at are. And you can only see that, of course, in the, um, the scene editor. Um, it might make more sense to do something like a capsule shape because it is a bit round after all. But I'm going to take this collect collider bounds and I'm going to make it a little bit more reasonable here. Uh, make it so that only the main parts will actually deal damage and uh, remove the projectile. So let's save that there and it should be is trigger and the reason we make it is trigger in box collider 2d is so that it can't interact in terms of physics but something passing through it can trigger the on trigger enter 2d method so basically it only serves to have something happen when something enters it uh, which in this case if it's a character it's going to take damage and then destroy the projectile so let's go ahead and hit play here and see if it works do, do, do. and it did not collide for some reason. Let's find out why that is. Okay, Okay. after messing around with it for a little bit, 
what we needed was a rigid body 2d set to kinematic mode for the player so um to cover rigid bodies really quick uh, dynamic rigid bodies allow physics to interact with it you can have things like gravity and objects can push each other and kinematic objects have to be moved specifically with the script so that would be things like doing transform.translate on a game object in order to move rather than applying a force to the rigid body 2d but in any case a kinematic rigid body so you add a rigid body 2d and you make the body type kinematic will allow the collision to occur between this game object and uh, the player so once again I'm gonna correct the rigid body a little bit uh, one more thing I want to point out here is uh, while I was looking through some of the documentation uh, transform.translate is actually a better way to apply a change in the position of a transform so rather than creating a new vector with the updated values you can just change the values by translating or moving it in the directions of XYZ so in this case I'm adding in the move speed times delta time on every frame and nothing for Y and nothing for Z. So it does the exact same thing as this up here, but this is probably a more proper way to do it. So let's go ahead and play this one more time. And I'm gonna click on the player, if I can, uh, to show that the player does take damage here. So uh, where's the player script? Ah, okay, character script. You can see it, it, the base health is set to 50, but because that projectile was able to interact with it, took five damage and the projectile was destroyed. So one more thing I want to show regarding projectiles would be how to add a sound to them. Now on my Gumroad there's a audio script that allows you to create audio sources on demand. But if you want to do it the classic Unity way, then you can do so by adding in a audio source component directly onto the projectile. So with this audio source you're going to want to play an audio clip of course. You can click on this little circle over here to select uh, sound effect from your game assets library. So I'm gonna select this fireball sound effect. You want to turn off play on a wake off and we actually want the sound effect to trigger when the fireball collides with the player. So in order to make this sound effect play when they collide what we can do is add in a reference to the audio source here. So I'm gonna call this audio source audio source and we want to get a reference to that on awake. So audio source equals get component audio source. So that should mean that now for this projectile scripts, you should have an audio source attached to it. Uh, caps matter, careful there. And now when they collide, we're going to want to take the audio source and we're going to want it to play whatever sound clip is inside of it. Now there's gonna be one more issue here, which is that if you destroy the game object immediately, what's going to happen is that um, the audio source will be destroyed along with it, so you won't hear the sound effect. And that's one thing that the Gumroad audio script I've been talking about, uh, which I have other tutorials on, helps with. Because when you use that, you can target any transform to add the audio source onto, rather than having the audio source have to be on this game object, which is about to be destroyed. So actually, rather than setting the game object inactive, because that will stop running the scripts on the game object, uh, a better way we can do it would be to take the Collider 2D attached to it and the Sprite Renderer. And now that I think about it a little bit more, rather than setting the game object to false, because I think that'll stop the scripts, what we should really have happen is that the renderer attached to it and the collider attached to it will just make those inactive rather than the entire game object inactive. So what we can do here is do git component on the sprite renderer. So we can take the sprite renderer and set the color, the alpha to that. Uh, so just like the position, we can't set the individual properties of the color individually. So I'm going to do a new color and we'll make it 1111, which is perfect white, but with full alpha. Oh, wait, oh, sorry. We want no alpha um, to make it completely invisible. Um, and then we need to get component on the Collider 2D and we want to make that inactive. So enabled equals false. This is going to mean that the sprite will be invisible and the game collider can't collide anymore. And then before we do the final destroy on the game object, we can take the audio sources clip length 
and wait that many seconds. And finally, in order to start triggering the final destruction in the update method, we can say collided equals true. And we'll need to create that Boolean up here. So collided Boolean, that should default to false. So this is gonna be set to true after it collides. So if it's, if it's collided, Okay, so now what we want to check in Collided is how much duration has um, occurred with the audio clip being played. So one way we can do that is audio source dot time, which is going to give you the playback position. So if that is equal or greater than the clip length, then that's going to mean that it's done. So if audio source time is greater than or equal to clip length, then we can destroy the game object. Okay, so with this implementation, it should in theory work and the update method will keep being able to be called until the audio source is finished playing. But I'm gonna do one more thing. If it hasn't collided yet, I'm gonna update the transform. Um, this is just kind of more for good practice. You won't be able to see it and it won't be able to collide with anything, but we really don't need the projectile to keep moving invisibly while it has collided um, because we're only keeping it in the scene so that it can play that sound source. Okay, so let's go ahead and test this out in the actual game. Okay, so as you could see, the fireball collided, it turned invisible, it wasn't able to collide anymore. So the player's health is still 45, and it remained in the scene until the audio clip was done playing, and then it destroyed itself. So that was exactly what we were looking for. Okay, so one more thing I want to change here is that the projectile should be facing to the right because we are applying a movement to the right. So I'm actually going to flip the axe on the sprite renderer so it's always facing to the right and we're going to change the box collider and make this face over here as well um, now with this if we were to say rotate it later on uh, let's say 180 degrees and we were moving it in the same direction it would just move to the left properly so really the only thing that needs to happen is that the flip axe should be checked there for this particular sprite um, just make sure that your sprite is moving in the direction that it's actually facing. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can probably just go ahead and hit play. So I'm going to hit play, we'll test it out, and then we'll kind of duplicate things a bit. Okay, great. So now with this one item, we can duplicate it a lot. And go ahead and hit play one more time. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to creating a basic projectile inside of Unity. So I've been Chris, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in my future video content.